everyone. Thank you again for joining us at our Green Chemistry Connections this month. Um, and we're very excited to have you all here for our two wonderful speakers who will be talking about inspiration from nature, bio-inspired, and bio-based materials. Um, before we get started, we do want to remind you that the event is being recorded. Um, while it's expected that the video feed will focus mostly on the presenter and their slides, um, your voice and video feed might appear at some point. So by attending this discussion, you are giving us consent to post this video and audio of you online. Um, again, more details of this are in the chat if you are interested, um, and thank you for joining. So before we get started, we'll introduce ourselves. So my name is Guggen. I'm a PhD student at McGill University, and I'm joining you here from Montreal, Canada. Um, and I'll pass it on to my other co-hosts. Uh, I'm Sarah, and I'm also a PhD student at McGill University, so I'm also here in Montreal. Hi, my name is Jasmine Hong. I am also, like Sarah and Guggen, a PhD student at McGill University, and I'm excited to see you all today. Hello, everybody. I'm Cynthia Milagre. I'm an associate professor and joining from Brazil. Hi, everyone. I'm Oyeshola Akishipo from Nigeria, Taishola University of Education. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry. So this Green Chemistry Connections is brought to you by the support of Millipor Sigma, as well as ICL. Um, we couldn't have done this without our sponsors. Um, next slide. OK. Yeah, and since um, I'll, a number of us are located Hello. on Montreal land. Um, we just want to do a land acknowledgement. So McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and the waters on which we meet today. And as Canada is bilingual, um, I will read now the announcement in French. So, l'Université McGill is serving un placement qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les peuples autochtones, y compris les nations Odinishone et Nishinabe. McGill Honor reconnaît et respecte ces nations à titre des tendances traditionnelles des terres et de l'eau sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Now, moving on to. And as I'm uh, joining from Brazil, in the spirit of reconciliation, we pay respect to to the indigenous people of Brazil, who are the first knowledge holders of its land. Presently, this meeting place is still home of more than 300 indigenous nations, and we honor, respect, and celebrate the diversity of peoples connected to this land. Uh, perfect. And um, just some logistics for the Zoom um, call. Um, please do add your pronouns to the Zoom display name. So you can just go to rename um, and from the drop down menu on the right hand side um, and add your pronouns so that we can identify and um, and talk to each other um, using the proper pronouns. Um, also, a live transcript is enabled. So if you click CC, you'll be able to see a transcript at the bottom. Um, I think it's only offered in English, but um, it can help you out. Um, and additionally, the slides and the transcript will be made available after the connections um, and will be sent out to everybody. So we'll just um, address the code of conduct for the Green Chemistry Connections. So it's important to us that everyone feels a strong sense of belonging during these connections. Um, so by participating, you agree um, to follow ex these expected behaviors um, a professional, respectful, considerate conduct. Um, this is a welcoming um, open space. So being, we encourage everyone to be respectful of um, the different people who are joining us today. Um, and we will not tolerate any acceptable behavior such as harassment or discrimination. Um, if you see any of these behaviors, it, either in the break rooms or chats or whatever, please let one of the one of us um, Green Chemistry Connection organizers know. And now to just briefly go over today's agenda. So our first talk will be by Professor Matthew Harrington from McGill University. And following this, we'll have a series of breakout rooms and then a short break. And then after the break, we'll have Professor Julio Pastre from the University of Campinas from Brazil. And then there'll be more breakout rooms and then we'll do a wrap up.
Awesome, thank you. Um, and to get started off, um, I'm going to introduce the first professor. He's actually my boss and um, my research prof in general, so I'm very excited to have him here. Um, so Professor Ma Matthew Harrington is a professor and a Canadian Research Chair Tier 2 in Green Chemistry in the Department of Chemistry at McGill University. He's also a co-director for the Mayam Institute of Advanced Materials called Mayam and the Director of McGill Chemistry uh, Characterization um, at McGill. He received his PhD in 2008 from the, chemist, uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the lab of um, Herbert Wade. Um, and this was followed by a humble postdoctoral fellowship at the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces in the Department of Biomaterials. Um, the, here, he later uh, became a research group leader in 2010 um, and stayed there in 2000, until 2017. His research is focused on understanding biochemical structure property relationships in the function and formation of biological materials and applying extracted design principles for the development of sustainable uh, sustainable production of bioinspired materials. So uh, join me in welcoming um, Professor Matthew. Thanks. And uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, it's it's a real pleasure, um, you know, to be able to to join for this. And uh, I haven't also have not been able to attend one of these green chemistry connections, but I can see that it's a really nice uh, a nice community. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to presenting some of our work uh, and also chatting and and uh, yeah, chatting with with people who are who are interested. Yeah. So um, as Gagan uh, mentioned, uh, our group. Um, at the at McGill University uh, is in the chemistry department, and we're interested in what we can learn from nature about how to make materials uh, that are better and that have better uh, that are produced in a more sustainable way. Uh, before I get started, this is a picture of the group. You can see Gagan over here, <laughs> uh, and uh, I just want to point out a few of the people that did the work that I'm going to talk about today. Acknowledge them. So um, this work is mainly uh, from Lucia and, and Franci, uh, Tobias, Max, and Janais. Um, and uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about their work. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge them at, at, the, uh, at the forefront. Um, and in our group, uh, what we do is we, we study biological materials. We study materials that are made by living organisms. And um, we're interested to understand uh, why they have the properties they have, uh, and also how they're made. And so the reason we want to understand that is because um, despite the fact that you have this huge range of um, of different um, of different types of materials with with different properties, you have these kind of hard yet incredibly tough um, composite mineral composite materials like bone. This is the skeleton of a deep sea sea sponge. Uh, of course, we've all seen shells at the beach. Um, and of course, we have wood, which as humans, we still use today to, to build things. Uh, you have something like the insect uh, cuticle. Um, I'm In my group, I'm really interested in fibers. So I'm absolutely fascinated by spider silk, which is uh, one of the toughest material, polymeric materials on the planet, if not the toughest. And of course, what I'll talk a lot about today is, is the muscle business. So despite this diversity, this amazing diversity of different properties, um, the starting materials that are used to make um, biological materials are pretty uh, meager. Let's say they're, they're pretty uh, basic, right? I, I mean, it's proteins, sugars, and fats, right? I mean, this is things you find in, in a description on a cereal box or, or uh, you know, in, in any food uh, ingredients. And then you have things like calcium carbonate, uh, you know, glass, silica, hydroxyapatite, which is a, a calcium phosphate based uh, mineral. These are really basic ingredients. And yet we can achieve the most amazing material properties using them. And nature has tricks how it does this, right? Um, it, it uses something called hierarchical structure to, to achieve these properties. It arranges material components like proteins and minerals in ways we can't even dream of, uh, and it achieves these amazing properties. So one of the things we want to do is learn how to make better materials. We want the, these materials, like I said, spider silk, toughest material on the planet, uh, toughest polymeric material on the planet, blows away our, our polymers, uh, our plastics, yet 
these materials are also made in a completely biologically friendly way. They have to be. They're made by living organisms, right? So by definition, they are they're biologically friendly. Um, so we we want to borrow from nature to make better materials. And what I mean by better here is high performance. They have great properties and they have so-called smart behaviors like self-healing properties or, um, you know, actuation or, you know, underwater adhesion, things that we can't really achieve at this point. Uh, and when I say in a better way, I'm talking about materials that are produced sustainably um, and uh, that are also biodegradable. Um, so in our group, we focus on a number of different types of organisms. I've been studying the muscle business since my PhD, so that's going on, uh, I hate to admit it, but like 20 years now. Uh, I've been focusing on these little fibers, and every time I try to get away from them, I get sucked back in because there's something really interesting about them uh, that I discover, and I hope you'll see that today. Um, but also, we've, we've gone off uh, into some other areas. So Gagan's project, for example, focuses on uh, these little cool little creatures called velvet worms that um, produce uh, these, um, you know, very stiff uh, fibers um, through a, a, an ejection of slime out of their head. So this, these uh, fluid turns into a solid uh, in a fraction of a second um, as they're ejected out of the head. And uh, but the cool thing is that they're also um, recyclable. So you can dissolve these fibers and then you can from that solution of dissolved protein that was a fiber, make a new fiber. Um, and the other thing we study are, are uh, mistletoe fibers. Um, these are really interesting in terms of plant-based adhesives, but also um, really stiff uh, fibers that, again, can be produced very simply. So we study these because we want to understand what's called structure-function relationships, and that's going to teach us um, what is it about the chemistry of this material uh, the biochemistry that gives it the properties it has, right? So, so we want to understand that, but we also really want to understand the fabrication processes that are underlying um, the formation of these materials, right? Because if we just understand, um, you know, why they have the great properties, but we can't recreate that because we don't understand how they're actually fabricated, then we're not in a better position. So, about six or seven years ago, we shifted gears to also really focus on this fabrication and spend super interesting. Um, and if we're successful, if we're successful to actually fully understand these processes and the chemistry that under, underlies them and the physics, um, we can maybe replicate this. So today, I'm really going to focus a little bit on um, the muscle business. I'm going to tell you two short stories and then one longer story on on uh, on these um, on these materials, so the byssus uh, is what we call this thing, and it's made up of you know fifty to one hundred fibers that are then glued onto an underwater surface, um, and they're incredibly strong. They function to prevent the muscle from being ripped off from waves. And to show you this, uh, we have a little video here of uh, Max uh, pulling a muscle attached to a rock out of our tank, and now he's pulling on the rock, and he's going to try to rip um the muscle off the rock and you can see we're generating really high forces um and eventually it comes off and what you'll see is that the byssus remains entirely intact we did not break these fibers they're incredibly tough they can take a lot of energy and forces before they fail in fact you can see little pieces of the surface of the rock that have like peeled off <laughs> that's how that's how effective this underwater adhesive is right so um, if we kind of break down what is this thing, um, you can see, well, yeah, there's this fiber. Um, and this fiber is attaching uh, the muscle to a stone. This is the underwater adhesive. And then it's actually um, anchored into the living tissue of the muscle, which is uh, really crazy. You have this, this material is non-living. It's completely protein-based and you have it making a contact with a, a living surface. So today I'm going to tell you a brief story about the core, uh, so these are the fibers. And these, again, are as, uh, very tough. They're as tough as Kevlar. Kevlar is um, a, a synthetic polymer that we use to make bulletproof vests, right? It can absorb a lot of energy. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a longer story about the adhesive and how the adhesive is made. And of course, this is an amazing thing because muscle, you know, if you had the experience of trying to glue or tape something on a wet surface, you know how ineffective human-made adhesives are on, on wet surfaces, yet the muscle does this no problem. 
And then finally, I'm going to tell you a really quick story, um, or this is the story that's in the middle, of some recent findings that's really incredible of this interface that the muscle makes with, uh, with, the, not, with the living uh, tissue uh, between the, the business. So to get started, um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about how these threads are made, because as you can see here, this is a fiber that has a lot of, um, it has a lot of different regions that perform different functions, but they all have to work together. So how do you make something that's so, um, you know, structurally and compositionally diverse? Um, well, the muscle does this using an organ called the foot, and the muscle will poke the foot out of its shell, um, and it looks like a, like a little tongue, uh, and it will feel around, and it'll find a spot it wants to make a, a thread, and it'll attach onto it, and it'll start secreting proteins into this groove that runs along the, uh, the surface, the top of the, the foot. And in a matter of three to five minutes, you have this fiber that pops out. Um, and uh, normally in 24 hours, a muscle will make, you know, 25 to 50 fibers. They'll just rapid fire make them. How is this possible? Again, this material has such incredible structure and properties uh, that are better than almost all of the plastics that we make, yet it just did this under seawater conditions in a matter of seconds. So how does this work? Well, we started looking this uh, at, at this um, back in like 2016. Um, a very talented, at that point, uh, he was a master's student, Tobias Primel, uh, who's in my group in Germany, um, started looking at this and, you know, we just found such cool, cool, cool things. And, and if we look at the, the muscle foot, you have the groove running along the foot and surrounding the groove are these secretory glands, which store the proteins. Um, and they store them in these tiny vesicles, about one micron. Um, and they store them in um, like a fluid phase. So it's like this highly dense fluid phase that's packed up inside these little, um, you know, vesicles, these little bags of, of uh, protein. And then what happens is the muscle uh, during the secretion process will um, start secreting these, the contents of these vesicles into the groove here, the 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 vesicle, the proteins are fluid, they'll align, and then they'll be solidified. Right. So you want them to be fluid during the processing, like just the way you have a polymer melt, except this is happening at, at you know, at seawater temperature, like four degrees C on a winter day. Um, and you, but you need to then trigger this to solidify. So how does this work? Uh, that was kind of our big mystery. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the core first, and then I'll tell you about the the other parts. So with the core, again, this this fiber is incredibly tough, as tough as Kevlar. I spent uh, my group, uh, I started this actually during my PhD, but um, and continued it when I started my group, we spent about nine years trying to figure out why does this thing have such great properties? Why does it have this, um, this high toughness? And we used a lot of x-ray diffraction, which is a technique that tells us about um, structure at different length scales. Um, we used x-ray absorption spectroscopy. So it's another technique that tells us about uh, special types of crosslinks that we were looking for. Um, and the main take home message was that the proteins, which are these kind of like rigid rod like proteins, um, are actually organized in an incredibly highly uh, crystalline structure or paracrystalline structure. So beyond, you know, a normal polyethylene, um, you know, um, uh, semi crystalline polymer, I mean, these are way more crystalline. And it's actually that that high degree of structure that gives us the um, the great properties. So we wanted to understand, well, where does this like incredible structure come from? So we started studying these vesicles that were inside the foot. And what we found was really, really exciting because we saw that the muscle is actually um, storing the precursors as a liquid crystal phase. OK, so liquid crystals, that's like, you know, what's in your LCD display. Um, what this is, is is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fluid phase. It can flow like a fluid, yet the molecules in it tend to be aligned. Um, and in this case, it's a very special type of um, liquid crystal that was never seen before in nature. It's called a smectic liquid crystal. And it means that the molecules don't just align in the same direction, but they actually form layers like books on a shelf. And we were able to use um, you know, high uh, advanced uh, electron microscopy to prove this, not only in two dimensions, but actually make a three dimensional reconstruction of these uh, of these liquid crystal phases. So then the question was obviously, well, 
how does it why does it form a liquid crystal phase where you know what is the chemical driving force that that causes it to do this uh and uh that's when we um we took a look back at the biochemistry and we saw that the um the sequence of proteins actually has this block like structure where in the middle of the protein where you have this rigid domain um this is enriched in positive and negative charges and so it's very hydrophilic it's very polar but at the ends of this you have these two domains that have no charges and are very nonpolar and then at the very end you have something really weird uh, so we know that the storage conditions inside here are slightly acidic, about pH 5. In that case, you have a lot of positive charge. And then in seawater pH, you all of a sudden lose this charge. We're like, what's going on here? Well, this has to do with the fact that these end domains are enriched in an amino acid called histidine. And histidine has a pKa at 6.5. So that means at acidic conditions, it's going to be protonated. At um, basic conditions, it's going to be deprotonated. And when it becomes deprotonated, it able, it's able to form these very special crosslinks called um, metal coordination bonds. So it, it grabs like three of these histines or four of these histines will grab on to a zinc ion and make this really strong yet reversibly breakable crosslink. So this was a really cool finding because the block-like structure tell us, okay, that's what's causing these to go into these layers. But the, um, the deprotonation gives us a pH trigger for assembling this thing from going for going from a liquid phase where these ends are repelling each other to a cross-linked structure instantaneously as this thing goes into seawater. So this was super exciting. And we took this uh, concept and then we said, well, we have a, you know, we can buy peptides, which are just short uh, protein uh, regions. And we sent away to the company and asked them to send us uh, or make for us these uh, these peptides that were based on the sequence uh, from these histidine rich domains. And when we started playing around with these, we found that even just the peptide itself is pH responsive. Uh, so at the acidic pH, it's unstructured. At basic pH, we can get it to form into these uh, highly structured regions called uh, beta sheets. Uh, and then our beta sheet crystallites. And then we can mechanically reinforce these with metals. And we use this to make uh, hierarchically structured films. We connected uh, the peptides onto synthetic polymers, uh, and we were able to use this to make um, uh, pH and metal responsive hydrogels. And then finally, uh, a student, um, a recent uh, a PhD student who just uh, defended, Mustafa Ramal, um, he was able to functionalize the surface of these very tiny um, hydrogels uh, with the peptide and show that he could inject this into a physiological buffer and that they would aggregate uh, in the presence of zinc. And this actually turns out to be a really great uh, material for uh, tissue scaffolds. So you could imagine, um, you know, injecting this into a patient uh, seeded with cells and cells just love to grow on this. So it could be for tissue regeneration um, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so it told us that if we understand the chemistry behind uh, the behind how this all works, uh, we can actually make some new really cool materials with with interesting properties. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears really quick here, and I'm going to focus on this living non living interface, which was a project we started about um, three or four years ago. Uh, with a, uh, an undergraduate uh, who, who attended my advanced materials class, who uh, Janaeus, who was just really um, interested to join the lab. And I had this as kind of a side project. I said, yeah, let's try this out. Because like, nobody had really ever looked at this interface between the living, non-living material. Now, why would we be interested in that? We're interested in that because there's a lot of efforts now. Uh, well, obviously, design of new implants and, and better implants, um, the way that non-living materials and living materials interface is really important. And one of these areas where it's particularly important uh, is in kind of brain computer interfaces where, um, you know, in this example, um, a um, paraplegic um, person is able to, you know, control uh, things uh, using uh, using this brain computer interface um, and regain some of, uh, of, of what they had lost. Uh, but there's some real challenges there for making this interface because this material is very hard your brain is very soft and you can actually have, um, you know, mechanical and, and, and mechanical damage at the interface, which uh, is a problem. So we looked to nature and we said, well, you know, we know that the muscle actually makes this really strong interface. 
um, you know, we, we I showed you that video earlier, you know, it can sustain about 20 newtons of force um, before it will actually, uh, you know, the, the byssus will pull off the rock. So it's very strong. But the crazy thing is that we noticed that the muscle would sometimes just completely let go of its byssus and make a new one. So it's 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 a quick release, you know, it, it's releasable. So we got really interested in that. And um, if you look here, uh, this is a muscle that's been opened and we can see here, all the threads are actually attached onto this thing called the stem. And then the stem actually anchors into the tissue. But of course we can't see uh, inside this tissue. But if if uh, we found a, a byssus that actually has been released, this part here is called the stem root and uh, this is what's inside the tissue. So we used a technique called micro CT. This is like, uh, you know, if you got a CT scan on, on your brain or something like that, but just much smaller. And we focused on this little region here and we, um, um, you know, we, we wanted to see what's the structure of this. So this video is showing you in blue what happens to the stem as it goes deeper into the material. And uh, so we're, we're reconstructing this in 3D. And what we can see is that the stem actually breaks apart into like about 50, 40 or 50 sheets that are interdigitated with the living tissue. And in fact, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this video it was on Mythbusters where they interdigitate two telephone books. You cannot pull them apart. So if you want to demonstrate this uh, to your, your students in, in your class, you can easily do this where you take two books and you kind of interleave the pages you will not be able to pull this apart. Um, it took two tanks, like uh, army tanks, to pull two phone books apart. Um, and uh, so I, I recommend having a look at that. So this is a very strong interface. But then the question is, well, why, how can it be quick release? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so then we used another technique, focused ion beam SEM, to reconstruct this at a much smaller length scale. So these light blue things are these sheets. The dark blue is the living tissue. And the red thing we we were uh, surprised to see are cilia. Cilia are little hairs on the surface of of uh, some cells uh, that can move. They can beat like this, and they're inside your lungs, and they're moving mucus and you know dust around and helping to keep your lungs clean and all this. Um, what were they doing here at this interface? We this was completely unusual, and there's nothing like it that uh, was previously seen. Uh, so another grad student, uh, Lucia was working on this project and she said well um you know her and her and uh, Janaeus had had this hypothesis that the cilia were actually important for for this quick release mechanism and they hypothesized that the movement of the cilia might actually make the release easier uh and so they found this paper where they saw that serotonin uh, will make uh cilia beat faster and dopamine will make them stop and so they said, well, can we order some serotonin? And I was like, well, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work, but go for it. And it totally worked. Uh, and you can see in this video that when they add serotonin, the, the cilia start beating faster. They add a serotonin um, receptor blocker. They slow down and you add serotonin again. They increase. But more importantly and more excitingly, mechanically, they found that they could use a much lower force to pull out the the whole thing, uh, the whole byssus, when they injected first with um, with serotonin, which is five five HT. When they added dopamine, they saw the forces increase. So really, we see this really interesting connection between um, between uh, the the release of of serotonin probably by the muscle. It senses its environment and it can control this. So that was a really cool finding. Um, okay, so the last story I want to tell with my remaining time is kind of about underwater adhesives. So um, muscles are able to attach on wet surfaces. As we already mentioned, um, you know, we're not that good at that right now, right? If you if you take a scotch tape or whatever, put it on an even moist surface, you're not going to get good adhesion. That's because you have to displace the water. Um, yet muscles are highly effective at this. We would love to be able to do this as well for things like dental cements and surgical glues. Uh, and here the muscle is laying down uh, fiber after fiber just with, with zero effort. So how does this work? Um, it was discovered through you know, 20, 30 years of biochemical investigations in the old school way before everything was kind of possible through proteomics and transcriptomics. Um, that adhesion is really based on the, the uh, effect of two proteins, which are enriched in this really unusual amino acid called 3,4-dihydroxyphenylalanine, uh, or DOPA. Now, 
Uh, why is it unusual? It's unusual because it's not one of the 20 standard amino acids. In fact, the organism takes uh, a tyrosine, which is one of the normal amino acids, and uses an enzyme to convert it to dopa. That costs energy. Evolutionarily speaking, um, something that costs energy is not going to stick around if it doesn't serve a purpose. And it turns out um, that DOPA is actually really key in making adhesive interfaces with the surface, but also in forming crosslinks also with metal ions, right? So we talked about histidine before, now we're talking about DOPA. Um, and so engineers and chemists, this was discovered about you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, they jumped on this and they, they um, started making um, you know, materials that took advantage of, of catechols uh, the, the so-called muscle-inspired materials um, to make uh, coatings, to make, um, you know, hydrogels that, that were mechanically tunable uh, and self-healing, but also uh, really importantly, surgical adhesives that could, that could function, uh, for example, for prenatal surgeries um, uh, and uh, where you can't use sutures, you have to use a, an adhesive. So this was really interesting, but none of these materials match the performance of the native plaque. So we really want to understand how um, does the muscle make this? So we go back to the drawing board. We go back to the foot. This is, again, another CT image of a foot. Um, and we can uh, use a 3D reconstruction of it to identify the glands where the, um, the plaque is made, where the adhesive is made. And that's what you're seeing in green here. And in blue, we were able to see these um, channels that are running through the gland. Uh, which you can see here. And these channels, uh, we call the longitudinal ducts, are running from the gland to the place where the adhesive is made. And so this is a cross section of one of these channels. And what you can see is that these little um, droplets of adhesive precursor are surrounding this. Uh, if we look a little closer with electron microscopy, you can really see them here in green. And this is a nucleus. This is uh, mitochondria. This thing here is the inside of the channel, and it's, again, filled with cilia that help to move um, the protein along. And this is just a three-dimensional um, reconstruction of this uh, using Fibesium again. But you can really see how these are lined up to be secreted. Uh, one of the weird things that we discovered while we were there, though, um, so we used a technique called Raman spectroscopy, and this gives us fingerprints for specific um, components here. And so we were you know, verifying, okay, in green here, um, all these pixels here have uh, a spectra that looks like this. Oh, that's our protein. In red, okay, that's that's definitely a nucleus. Um, in blue, okay, that's the signal for cilia, right? So we could identify these things. But we kept seeing these um, pixels that uh, had this really weird signal. I mean, we knew what it was, um, but it just didn't seem like it should be there, right? So this is a, a signal for one of these dopa metal coordination uh, bonds. Um, now, the protein, which we know ends up being crosslinked with these metals, is here, and there are no crosslinks. So this seemed to be a place where the muscle is actually storing the metals uh, prior to secretion. And we were able to prove this using a um, technique called X-ray fluorescence. Um, and what really surprised us is that the, metals, uh, the, the metal that the muscle was mainly using was iron, but also vanadium. Uh, and vanadium was, uh, is a metal that's very rarely used in nature because, well, often it's toxic. Um, but the muscle was somehow using this, and it was um, uh, pure. It was concentrating this in its body in these tiny little particles that we called the metal storage particles. And so we wanted to understand, like, well, what role do the metal storage particles and um, the proteins play together? Uh, and we hypothesized that they might be co-secreted and then they're being mixed inside these uh, channels and that this is what's allowing them uh, to be formed in this kind of very subtle way to give them their excellent properties. And so what you can see here is a, is a still of this kind of three-dimensional uh, image uh, where you can see the vesicles being secreted into the groove or into the duct. And here is the formation of the adhesive. Uh, again, using Raman spectroscopy, these are pretty pictures, but it doesn't give us uh, any compositional data. So with Raman spectroscopy, we're able to trap this at various time points. And anywhere you see green is our protein. And anywhere you see pink is where you get metal coordination. So you have metal coordination in the storage, uh, stored in the metal um, storage particles. And inside the duct, you have some protein that's been secreted. This is an early stage. At a later stage, we see the protein filling the duct and we see little particles in there, but um, the protein remains uncrosslinked. 
However, at a later time point, you can see that the metal from the metal storage particles is actually spread out to the protein and started to cross-linking it. So this you can imagine kind of like a two-part epoxy um, and uh, that's slowly slowly being mixed together to form this, this highly effective underwater adhesive. Um, and if we take the, the ratio of one of the protein peaks to one of the metal coordination peaks, you can see how this metal coordination is actually spreading out um, from these hot spots, which were the uh, the metal storage particle. So we think that uh, what we see here is is going to give us some new insights into how to make um, better underwater adhesives uh, more effectively uh, and more sustainably. Uh, so this is just a, a quick overview of uh, kind of the, the mechanism we think at play here. So we have these little fluid droplets, which mix together with the metal storage particles. Uh, at low pH, and then the metals leach out from the metal storage particles, and then as this reaches seawater, um, it becomes um, cross-linked and um, and hardens and uh, and glues onto the surface. So, um, in summary, uh, so that that's that's the end of the talk. Now, uh, I just I hope I could convince you that um, nature holds all these secrets. We have no idea. I mean, you you probably eat mussels, maybe you don't, but if you've, you, if you've ever eaten them, you probably will pull the business out and throw it in the trash and not think twice about it and you'll eat the mussel. But I, I would ask you to just pause the next time uh, you might, even if you go to the beach and you just see a mussel, you're not eating it, right? Uh, just pause and appreciate the complexity of this little tiny fiber and what it can teach us about like life uh, and, and how to make better materials. And also imagine that there's so many other systems that nobody's ever looked at. Uh, so this is also a good call for protecting uh, biodiversity uh, on the planet uh, and, and also um, expanding our, our view into other creatures like velvet worms. Uh, <laughs> uh, so with that, I again would just want to thank uh, all the students who contribute to this um, and uh, uh, the collaborators who were, were key and finally the funding and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Professor Arrington. Um, it was it's always great to hear about the work again, even though here maybe on a <laughs> daily basis, but it's always fun. <laughs> um, so now um, we're going to have our breakout room. So I'm just going to set those up. And if you're interested in talking to Professor Harrington, please join his group. Um, we also will have a breakout room for the Beyond Benign team. Uh, if you have any questions for us in general, um, and we will be back probably closer to one um, right before we have our break.